Hi, Tammy. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited. I'm, I I had this like this quarantine haircut, so I'm I'm going to spend this whole video doing this. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> like my hair is yeah, in my too. eyes. I, I have, can't I, stop. I, it. <laughs> my hair hasn't been this long, and I don't even know when. It's crazy. It's really crazy. Um, so welcome to the Elizabeth River Press Annual. I am so excited to have you here. And um, when I first started this project, it, it's been it's been a long time coming. Um, but when I first started, I reached out to several writers that I knew um, and, and said, you know, hey, if you've got a short piece and you want to be part of this, I would love to, to have you in it. And you were kind of last minute because you had posted on social media that you had some pieces or you were writing some pieces and you were looking for places to send. And it was just a, you know, a simple Facebook post. And I was like, oh, pick us because I would love to have you. Like, I just, I know anything you write will be amazing. And I would love to have you in, in this piece. Um, it says my internet connection is unstable. Can you, am I, am I good on your end? You're, you're okay. You're, you're okay. bouncing a little bit, but you're good. All right. Um, so I was so, you sent three pieces for us to consider and I did, I, I mean, I'd have taken all three of them. Um, but I, one of them really stood out to me and I, I have to say, and I hope I don't offend anybody. I think it's my favorite piece in the whole book. Um, Thank you. It is, I read it two or three times and, and each time I was just like, she gets short stories. Like she gets, this is what a short story should be. <laughs> you know, like, this is awesome. This, yeah, so I'm excited for everybody to, to read your piece in, in the annual. But you have other things going on right now. You just released a new book, right? I did. Yeah, I did. Um, Book of Promises, is that what it is? The Book of Promises, yes. Okay. It's a... Now, uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, it is actually very different from my first novel. It is a young adult suspense thriller, um, psychological. Everything I write has to have that psychological bent to it, whether it's short story or, or a, a novel. And it started out, I, I had been challenged, a friend of mine said she didn't think I could write anything that was a love, like had the love story. You know, um, I write lesbian, uh, strong lesbian characters in my work and other LGBTQAI characters because I think it's super important for that voice to get out there. And um, as, as a, an adult lesbian myself, I want to make sure that our voices are heard and all across the spectrum. Um, and then I also like to have other characters that are out of mainstream. But she had said that well, you, you, you need to practice writing a love story. And so originally it was supposed to be a, a piece, a, a coming out piece, a very, not, not totally sweet, but a very nice kind of coming out piece for my protagonist, Spencer. And I started writing and I got about 20 pages in and already things were happening that were <laughs> not sweet or cozy or anything else. And I thought, <laughs> ah, maybe she's right. Maybe I can't do this. But what I ended up with was actually some sweet and some really messed up and just a really raw, gritty coming out coming of age, dealing with people in our lives that are toxic for us kind of story. And uh, so, and that's, that's how it ended up. So. That's awesome. And that, that uncomfortable space is where your writing lives. So, yeah. you know, love story or not, I think that you could, you could make a love story in an uncomfortable space. And certainly for that audience, that's where we all live anyway. Yeah right? Especially at that young adult age. Yeah. Most of us, most of us probably have those coming out stories or those young adult stories that involve, you know, toxic family who we needed to love or walk away from or learn to love ourselves despite our differences. So yeah. that's cool. There, there's definitely an audience for that. You know, it's funny when I was that age, um, I remember going to you know, places, bookstores when bookstores existed, and and looking you know for the the LGBTQ section, and um, they were always very stereotypical. These stories were always um, the lesbian stories, especially, were very butch, manly women, 
who were trying to to be men and it wasn't something that i could relate to as a young lesbian because I, those weren't the women i was attracted to i knew those women um but that wasn't my life so i, I couldn't relate um so it's really cool that that you're writing something that's relatable yeah and, and i agree with you i'm i'm um when i came out it was just lgb there right. wasn't any of the other letters at all back then. And really, I mean, Ruby Fruit Jungle was, I mean, that, that was about all we had that was anything that we could relate to really at all. And even that wasn't something I really related to. It just didn't, it wasn't my life. It wasn't what was happening with me. And I, I think that even today, part of part of where this story came from was I teach in the community college or college sector, and I teach literature much of the time. And I was teaching a piece that had a strong lesbian um, presence. And one of my older students said, uh, "When I came out, it was really hard. The young kids don't know how lucky they are today. How much easier it is for them. Everybody understands it. Blah blah blah. The things." And a young person in my class said, what are you talking about? You know, that it may be different hard, but it's still hard. And there's still people that are being displaced because of it. And I had one young man in my class that said, you know, he, um, he couldn't tell anyone. His mom told him that if he ever uh, told anyone that he was gay, that he would be ousted from their entire family, not just from her, but from, from everyone. And another person in my class said, you know, I have a best friend who beat me almost to death when she found out um, that I had feelings for her in that way. And I mean, it just went on and on and on with the stories. And so um, what that said to me was it is just as hard and just as difficult today as it as it was when when I was growing up, it's it's different hard as my students said, but still very hard. And I think those stories still deserve to be told and still have a, a real definite place in our in our canon. I think. And I completely agree. And I think uh, describing it as different is I mean that hits the nail on the head. Um, my daughter is 15 and told me a couple years ago that she was pan. And I had to ask her, I don't know what that is. What is that? Yeah. Can you explain that to me? Because that's not part of, you know, what I dealt with growing up. And it was LGBT when I was, when I was coming out. And um, I never really considered liking anyone other than, you know, women as women. And the, uh, the exposure, I guess, to binary and, and trans wasn't there for me. It wasn't there when I was growing up. I certainly, it certainly is now, but it's a whole different world today than it was 25, 30 or, or more years ago. It just, it's completely different. And I see my, my own daughter, my own daughter has two moms and I see her struggling. And it's not that, you know, she's not accepted. It's that she, it, it, they're still in a place, there's still young teenagers or young adults still trying to find their place in the world. And it's it's not always easy and, and simple and it's it, it is very different but but it's it's still a struggle yeah very much a struggle yeah so that's good that's good that, that you're connecting on those levels with those young adults that's pretty awesome and that you have um written a, a piece for that that audience i think that 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 audience will be there and it will just get bigger over time we're seeing it in in tv um, I, I, I do a lot of screenwriting and there are a lot of calls for um, LGBT, especially gay women um, stories or, or characters. So the audience will just continue to grow from here. So that's awesome. Sandman was your first novel? It was. Yes. That, okay. Sandman How old is that now? A couple of years? December 2018. So okay. about so a year and a half. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And that's a thriller. So that's, that is that kind of uncomfortable psychological world that you typically live? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a psychological thriller and it deals with a serial killer on a very small strip of sand. I don't know if you know anything about 
Buxton or the OBX Outer Banks, mm -hmm. but it yeah. takes place on the Outer Banks in Buxton, which is just a really small town on this on that strip of island, and it's um, uh, the the media deems him Sandman because he buries his bodies in sand dunes, and so it's uh, it, it turns the entire town on its head when it's discovered, and it's um, so it's a very kind of dark, twisty psychological thriller that isn't I've been told isn't for the faint of heart <laughs> but again nice. my my protagonist is um, a very strong lesbian lead and mm -hmm. so the subplot is her kind of coming to terms with being in her own skin she's she's openly gay she's she's a paramedic she's in her 20s but she also struggles with connection with others and so her big thing is just going out and fucking and that's you know she she doesn't have the she's not looking for a relationship and and so it's her development through the subplot is kind of her development through all of that so very cool that sounds very patricia cornwell colonial parkway <laughs> yeah yeah um, I, and I think, you know, Patricia Cornwell, I haven't read her stuff in, in many years. I, I loved her. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of years near the Colonial Parkway. And as a teenager, when I started driving, I was terrified to, to be on that at, at night because of her books. Yeah. But I think one of the things that, that she did when she was, I don't know what she's doing today. I've just been way too busy over the last, I mean, really 10 years to keep up with all of my favorite authors and every new release that they have. So I have no idea what she's doing now. But I think that um, she would have had that really strong lesbian character um, back in the 90s if the audience was there or if the support, yeah. I shouldn't say the audience was certainly there, we were all there, but um, if the support was there to, to allow it to happen and, yeah. and it wasn't. So that's really cool that, that it is now and, and you can write that. That's awesome. How, I feel like I keep fading in and out. How is the internet connection on that end? Um, you're okay. You do, like I said, you do bleep a little bit, but nothing, weird. Uh, yeah, nothing really, nothing too intense. Nothing to, nothing to worry about. Okay. Really, it's really bizarre because um, I do this all the time and I've never really had problems, but I keep getting flashes on my screen. I'm like, <laughs> what's wrong? The landscaper's out back. Maybe he's messing with something. <laughs> okay. I don't know. So you are originally from Colorado, right? I am. You're from, I'm from Denver as well. That's what I thought we oh, had that in common. Yeah. 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 I am um, Denver born. And then when I was six, I don't know if you're from Denver, you might remember this. When I was about six years old, um, I was in a bunch of protests for Rocky Flats with my mom, who was, you know, 70s protester. And <laughs> I remember we, you know, Jackson Brown and film crew, we were in a, a documentary about Rocky Flats and um, as a result, we had to pick up and move to Virginia. <laughs> so I spent most of my childhood in Virginia and then went back with a with a girlfriend of mine in my 20s. And I was like, I'm, it's good to be home. Um, and then I left four years ago. So I was there for, you know, a good 20 years again. But um, now I'm in Arizona because I, I can't do winter anymore. I'm just, I'm done with winter. Yeah, but yeah. what's what what took, Carolina. I was going to say, what took you to North Carolina? Did, was it just a place to go? <laughs> or? It's kind of the same. I, I, no, well, I'm from, actually, the Book of Promises is set in Denver, oh, yeah. and my my father's, my, my living room where I grew up um, on South Washington Street is the living room that is in the book, I mean, that is described in the book as my father's living room, which is this very eclectic kind of funky mix of things, but um, my mom and dad divorced when I was a teenager, a young teenager, and I stayed with my dad and my sister went with my mom and my mom and my sister moved to Virginia and uh, Virginia Beach. And my, um, my, I lived with my dad then until I got married. And then when I got married, um, my husband wanted, he had the bright idea that we would move to uh, Missouri, Knob Noster, Missouri. And, that sounds exciting. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that was dumb. <laughs> But uh, just long enough for me to have a couple kids and 
decide that wasn't the life for me and divorce. And, and then I went back to Colorado. And then when my dad passed away, I moved to Virginia to be closer to my mom and my sister. And um, then about 13 years ago, my wife and I um, found jobs in North, that moved us to North Carolina. So we've nice. been here for about 13, maybe 14 years. We've been here for a while now, but we love it here. Yeah. I have family in Lewisburg and I have a, you mentioned the um, Outer Banks. I have a good friend who owns a little souvenir shop, something like that, um, somewhere in Outer Banks. I don't, I don't know exactly where it is, but I'll have to yeah, you should ask, ask her, her to stock your book. <laughs> yeah, put my book in there. I would sign a bunch of them and send them to her if she yeah. if she bought them. Well, her season starts. I think them. this this weekend yeah. opens opens the season. So yeah, we'll have to. How how far are you from the Outer Banks? About two hours, two and a half hours, maybe. It's not far. Yeah. So I haven't been at that way in in years. Um, my father passed away in 2012, and. That was the, well, no, I, I was going to say that was the last time I was in Virginia, but I went to a wedding in 2017, maybe, and got to see his gravesite for the first and, and only time. So, yeah, yeah I haven't been back so, east in a while. Yeah, I, and I, we've, we used to go to Virginia quite often. I have two daughters there. My two oldest daughters are in Virginia. So, and one in Chesapeake and one in Virginia Beach. So we, um, we go back that way some, but now as we're getting older, our kids travel more to us than we travel to them. So we haven't really been in, in a while. But. That's how it should be. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Here we come to us. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so you teach at a college level and you write. Yeah. Um, what else? What else can you share about your world? Well, I have a bunch of kids <laughs> and a bunch of grandkids. I, I actually, um, my wife and I have been together about 20 years and between us, we have seven kids. I have three that I, that are mine that I own. And then she has two that she owns <laughs> that she gave birth to. And then we have two others. Um, my first partner who I was with for 12 years, she had two daughters and she and I, our kids were really, really little at the time. And when she passed, when their mom passed away, Lisa just kind of adopted them in as, as her own. And so we've um, had our hands in the raising of seven between us and together. And then um, they all have kids now, except for our youngest. He doesn't have any yet. But the, all, but the others all have them. Two of my boys have twins. My, both of my boys um, have twins. My older son has two-year-old twin boys, and my youngest son has eight-year-old twin boys. Oh, wow. And then they have a smattering of others. So when I say all of that to say, I guess, when I'm not uh, writing or teaching or grading or mentoring or... Um, I'm usually with kids or grandkids, except in the last couple months, of course, when we haven't been able to do that. But I bet you've missed them. That's got to be really hard. It is. It is hard. Yeah. It's very hard. Wow. But I'd left my mom in Colorado and we had planned on you know, bringing her daddy, her birthday's in January. And I told her in January, like, I'm getting you a plane ticket for your birthday. You're coming down here to see us. And of course, it, you know, here it is almost the end of May and it still hasn't happened. So it's, it's tough. It's tough being far away from especially grandchildren. That's it is. It's yeah. really that's tough. Wow. So uh, it, it is almost the end of May. What is today? The 22nd? It's almost 22nd. The end of May. I have no idea. <laughs> We've been inside this house so long. I don't even know what day it is anymore. It's a like, whole year. Hey, yeah. Oh, it's crazy. crazy. Um, June 1st starts Pride Month, and we're not able to get out. Um, our Pride Festival is always in April when the weather is, is comfortable, um, yeah. and Phoenix has pushed it to November, which I'm hoping we'll still be able to do. Um, what do you plan on doing for, for Pride Month? Well, probably staying right here at home this year. You know, they've canceled the parade. So typically, we 
would go to Fayetteville Street here, which is where our big pride festival is. And my kids go and, and the grand, some of the grandkids go and we just hang out and have a good time. Um, this year they've canceled that, of course. I don't know if they're gonna reschedule it, so I don't know if we'll have it. Um, and I had kind of planned on, I was, I was trying to set up to have my books there on a table and do kind of a, um, just talk to people and sign books and sell and, and stuff. But of course that's not going to happen now either because yeah. everything is canceled. So I don't know, we'll likely just hang out and hope that this virus goes away soon. Uh, yeah, I don't even know what to think about all that's going on in the world. It's it's weird to think that states are opening and we have the ability here in Arizona, everything is open. And I'm still like, yeah, I don't know that I even wanna go to the store yet. <laughs> You no, know, I just I don't be out there. We went into phase two today at actually five o'clock today it starts. And um the bars are still closed. So a lot of things where there are a lot of people together, they're still closed, but you can go get a haircut, you can go so a lot of the smaller shops are open now, the mall opened. I'm like, mm -hmm. you are out of your mind if you think I'm going anywhere near any of that mess right now. There is no mm -hmm. way. We just had, we had de groceries delivered this morning and that's just kind of what we've been doing is just having our groceries delivered. And um, we're very lucky in that my wife and I both can work from home. And I don't know when the colleges will go back. They're talking about fall maybe, we'll see. But if they do go back, then I'll have to do that. Um, I'm not really sure how we'll handle that. She doesn't want me to. She said, just tell them you're not coming. You're not teaching <laughs> right now. <laughs> but no, that's yeah. easier said than done. Um, so I, I don't know how that's going to work. But her, she works for a uh, big tech company. And so she, her office has like 17,000 monitors and like green writing all over the screens and, you know, all the things. And um she typically goes into an office, but she's been, they've been home for two months now working. All of them have been working from home for two months now. And we're very lucky that she's able to do that without any real break in anything. And they just, they had a town hall actually, I think it was yesterday and said that they're not even considering, um, they probably won't even consider them going back before the first of the year. Uh, wow. if, if they go back then. So um, they've been, they've been really good about that. And uh, I, I, we've, we've talked to some of our friends that are stuck at home and we're very lucky. I mean, we still like each other, so, <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many people right now that are either they're in abusive relationships or they're, and it's just, it just breaks my heart. A lot yeah. of what's going on. But. Think about these kids we were talking about earlier and imagine mm -hmm. being the, the, the gay kid yeah. or the trans kid in, in a home where you're not accepted and you can't go anywhere. You, you get out. Yeah. 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 It's hard. I, I'm in a similar situation. I work from home. Um, my partner owns a company and she's essential. So she's out all the time. Nothing's really changed for her, but she's also my little errand girl. So anytime I need anything and I'm too uncomfortable to go out, she's like, I'll just get it on my way home. Yeah, um, and awesome. she owns a, a pool company. So she's around chlorine all the time. So she tells me all the time, like I, I absorb so much chlorine, like I'm clean. I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, but she's got your, you know, customer meetings and she's typically in backyards and she'll tell people like, I'm not shaking hands and don't come near yeah, me. Away. I have that a family at home. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. She, she actually even had a customer reach out who had tested positive just to let us know, you know, tell, tell the texts, you know, that I have tested positive, so I won't come outside and, you know, so it's, yeah it's something they didn't have to say you know they didn't have yeah. to disclose that and I, I think the communication has been just assume everybody's at risk so wipe That's down right. these gates and don't touch anything don't touch their lawn furniture just mm -hmm. get this stuff done and, and go yeah and get out yeah yeah it's really it's it's interesting I have I just have no idea where we're going to be as a as a society when this is all over but I'm pretty introvert I guess I'm like I'm an introverted extrovert I'm I'm good around people I'm okay around small groups I love talking to people I love hearing stories um but I don't I, I'm good like I don't need to go to parties and bars yeah, me and either like I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm very much like that I'm very much the same way I don't have like 
I can go in front of a classroom and teach all day long. It does, it's not that it bothers me to do that. I just have no desire to be around big groups of people or anything. Right. And I have to have my downtime to recharge. I, I have to be alone to recharge. I'm not one of those people that recharges in a group. They drain me, completely drain yeah. me. But. Yeah, that's exactly how I am. So uh, I, I told you before we started recording that um, I was gonna surprise you a little bit, but we've talked a little bit about Virginia anyway, but I was on your blog earlier and talking about um, Pride Month coming up, you had blogged last year for June and you said something about uh, in your blog that you had posted on Instagram every day for the month of June. And in your blog was a picture of the Hershey bar. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Virginia. That was where I used to go to. You said that you had walked in in like 1983, I think. I was probably mm -hmm. 10 years behind you. It was probably early 90s before I first stepped foot. But man, it's been a year and a half since they've closed their doors. And I still, all these years later, I mean, I haven't been there in many years. I still can't get over it. That was such an institution. It was, yeah. What yeah, did that I, mean I to really, you? I really want to write something about it. And I, I don't know, I, I haven't thought it all out yet, but I, I really, and I think it'll probably just be a short piece, but I want it to be central in something. And I would really like to interview people like you and um, people that have been there and that experienced that just pure family feeling that yeah. was the Hershey bar. And I walked in, they had just opened. So they, they were brand new. Annette was like a baby and Bill um, Bill wasn't a baby. Bill's like 15 years older than her or something like that. I don't know how much older, but quite a bit older, but um, they were so welcoming and, you know, he was the money and it was her baby, her idea. And she nurtured the women in there and mm -hmm. she was just this mother and she just loved everyone and still does. But um, I, I just, just when I think about it not being there anymore, it just hurts my heart because she put together Thanksgiving dinners for the people we were just talking about, the, yeah. the people who didn't have people to love them and they didn't have anywhere to go. And she would spend her own money and her own time and people would come together and donate things. And they would have this huge spread for the holidays, for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, for you know whatever holiday was coming up, she would um, invite them in. And she would just have things sometimes just because she knew that she had people that would come in that would be hungry or I mean it, it, it was just such a, a loving safe space and when I first started going there um, in the 80s it was life was scary back then I mean we had to back into our parking spots so that people wouldn't see our license plates mm -hmm. because you could be fired from a job you could be beat up you could be I mean there were just so many things that happened back then and we had a we had a blue light in there that would go off if the if someone came in and we needed to know like we needed to separate on the dance yep, floor yep. or we needed to do whatever <laughs> yeah and, and um, I just really would love to just write something that captured that but I just haven't figured out yet how to really capture the feeling and really make people understand what that felt like to people who felt like they had no home and that they were different and that they didn't belong and that they weren't ever going to be okay in the world. And then you walk through that door and like, whoa, you know, suddenly you're Are okay. People in the world. And home. Yeah. 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 It was such a great, uh, just a great place. I, mean, I, I will say that I didn't spend as much time there as I did at Babes in Richmond, but um, I, the first time I walked into Hershey Bar, I was with the woman who would become my girlfriend, and I was still very, you know, and I was underage, and, and they talked to her, and they let me in, and they were like, you, if I see a beer in your hand, you know, you're, none of you were coming back. <laughs> yeah, I was underage the first time I went in, too. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, but she was just like, look, if, if, you're, if you're questioning, if you're thinking, if you need a place to explore, so if you want to see what we're all about and this feels like home, come on in. And I was, I remember I'm 18, 19, really nervous. 
and had been around my lesbian friends who were out and very comfortable with them, but thinking, you know, I don't know. I don't know if this is me. I don't, I don't know. Um, and then within an hour, I was on the dance floor and I was dancing and, and it, it was just such a great, it was a great place. And I think for me coming out that, that early had a lot to do with the women at, at Hershey Bar. It oh, was, that's what a, so cool. Yeah. That's really and, cool. Um, so we have uh, floor seats, season um, tickets for uh, the Phoenix Mercury here at the WNBA. The woman who sits next to me, who I did not know before last season because we we finally got you know our set seats. Um, her name is Susan, and then she has a, a wife that doesn't really come to the games. And so the woman that sits next to her, her name is Jan. I don't remember Jan's last name, but anyway, we were talking one night during a game. And I learned that they spent their early adult, adult years in Virginia Beach. And I was like, oh, really? I'm from Virginia and da 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 and this and that. And Hershey Bar. I mean, that's all. <laughs> we had like a whole, like, we probably missed an entire game talking about Hershey Bar. And here we are in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, sitting down at a basketball game with somebody I don't know. And there's our connection. We've probably been in the bar at the same time, you know, like we're just yeah. really, really, really cool. And, and I, I hope I, I haven't, I don't even, I haven't heard from Annette or not that I keep in touch with Annette, but I haven't heard anything from her in, in media since 2018 when they closed, but I hope she knows, you know, that, that this is the culture that she built that, you know, there are women who don't know each other that are talking about her bar 25, 30 years after we last went, yeah, um, it, yeah, you know, across the country, two thousand miles away. Well, um, I'll make that's sure she the sees impact. this. Yeah, that's yeah. the impact uh, that that they had, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I was really sad to see them go. And I, I, um, we're we're Facebook friends. You know, I haven't seen her in years and years. Uh, yeah. She may not even know who I am. You know, it's one of those things. Um, who knows? She, she might, cause she was pretty good about that kind of stuff, but she might not too. And that's really not what's important. What was important was I just wanted her to know that, um, what an impact, you know? Yeah. 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 Mermaids in the basement. Yeah. Did you ever see them play there? Small world. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Um, so so for Pride Month, you're just going to hang out. Are you going to do what you did last year on Instagram and, and post something every day? Yes. Or, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm going to try. I haven't been on my blog in a while. I actually, I mean, things just got so crazy and so busy and there were just so many new things going on. And I had the deadline for the Book of Promises and no excuses. I just got lost in stuff and I haven't been posting. So I just recently went back on there and I'm, I'm trying to do kind of a rehaul. And as soon as I get things, I, I don't even have the Book of Promises posted on there yet because I went back in last week and I thought, oh, this is a mess in here. I just, I really need to clean some things up and I need to, I need to, um, I, I need to move some things around and, and do some things. And but I definitely, that's kind of my goal for the next couple of weeks is just to work on it and have it ready because I really want to start posting on the blog again. And I really want to post every day for pride. Yeah. 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 That's a great goal to have. I, I run into the same problem with my blog. I, I can't tell you the last time it was updated, um, but I write a lot and you know, I just save them in word and I, I just have too much going on, but it's a poor, like you said, no excuses. It's a poor excuse because yeah. There's an audience out there, and and if they don't see something, you know, posted recently, they're they're gonna stop yeah, clicking. They're gonna go away. Go away. Yeah, they go somewhere else. Yeah. 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 It's hard though. It's it's tough in this social media world to stay engaged with different audiences on different platforms all the time, and yeah. and keep working and keep keep writing and and publishing and yeah, it's tough. Yeah, that's the big thing with all the other things you have to do, and in today's world, you have to be a marketer as well. You know, yeah. and if you're not, your stuff's just going to sit there. And I, I watch people say, you know, all, all the time, I don't, you know, I wrote this book and I've sold it to two people. Well, what are you doing to market it? It, it, it can be the most wonderful piece in, in the world, but if you're not marketing it, it's, it, there are billions of people trying to do the same thing that you're doing. Yeah. It doesn't really matter how good you are. 
if you don't get your name out there and it's all up to you. And so I've been trying to learn uh, social media. I've been trying to learn kind of the algorithms of Twitter and, and Facebook and Instagram and what works. I've been trying to post some different things over the last year or so in different places. Oh, that worked really well on Facebook, but it didn't work at all on, on Twitter. I, you know, nobody paid any attention to it at all. Oh, well that really took off on Twitter, but it got zero hits on Instagram or, you know, it's, so you can't even post the same thing across everything. Yeah it has to be very specific to that particular audience. And that's where it gets time consuming. If yeah. I could write one thing, grab a picture of something and just post it out everywhere, that would be great. That would be easy breezy, but you can't do that. Everything has to be geared toward that audience. And even then building a following is like ridiculously hard. It takes a lot of time. And it, it's interesting. Um, I think, on the Elizabeth River Press Facebook page, um, your interview graphics ran the same day as, as mine. And so I don't know if you've read through mine. Um, I'm really behind. I haven't, I mean, I, I made them all and posted them all, but I haven't gone back and, and reacted or, or responded to any of the posts yet. But I mentioned in mine, um, Kate Tilton, who is in, uh, I think she's in Atlanta or just outside of Atlanta, if she's still there. I know she's still in business, but anyway, she has a great author services business and that would be one of my goals is to hire somebody like Kate to, to do all that for me um, because she's fantastic at what she does but at the same time I'm also friends with a lot of people who do that kind of stuff and I can say that anytime I'm asked to like a page I typically like it unless it's content that I wouldn't follow or or doesn't fit my lifestyle or I don't yeah. agree with um, and that's it's not it's it's not real. You know, I don't, I don't buy the, the products. I don't, you know, so I still wonder, even though I would, I, I think I listed as one of my goals to, to have enough income that I could hire somebody like Kate or hire Kate. Um, but at the same time, I wonder like how, how genuine are these audiences that they, these followers that they build? Because if you're just sending out to a bunch of people like this page and be part of this group, it doesn't mean that anybody's going to actually support your business uh, or buy yeah. your books. Yeah, but the, and here's what, um, what I'm learning, and I, I don't know, again, I, I have no idea if it's true or not, because, you know, you hear all these different things from different people, but um, one of the marketers that I was talking to about it is told, because I was saying very much the same thing. So, you know, I have uh, 5,000 followers on Twitter, but you get one like on something that you post. So, but it, it is really more for um, pitching. Mm -hmm. So if I pitch to, so I've had a billion people say Sandman needs to be a movie. Okay. That's wonderful. Except, you know, how are you supposed to do that? But anyway, that's, that's, you know, that's over here somewhere. But when they say something like that to you, what they don't understand is you can't just like go say, Hey, you produce movies, take this and read it and you're going to love it. And you're going to produce my movie. It's about catching the eye of someone. And the only way to catch the eye of someone, according to the marketer that I spoke to about it, is to have a huge amount of followers because you're of no use to them if you don't. And, and even though they're just kind of a lie, they're following you because for whatever reason they're following you, but they're not really serving you any purpose, but they are showing that you're able to build a following. And mm -hmm. if I'm gonna take a chance and produce something for you, if I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna turn your book into a movie, I wanna know that you have an audience. Right. And if you have, if you have um, 100 people following you, you have no audience for me. If you have 1,000 people following you, you have no audience for me. Now, if you have 10,000 people following you, maybe we're starting to see you have a little bit of a not, you know, you have a little bit of a following. If you have a million people following you, then yeah, let's talk because you already have a following that I can then go out and focus on. Right. Um, and that's kind of how she explained it to me, but I agree with you. It's still just this very fake thing. And I, well, I the, don't know how to tr maneuver in it. <laughs> the, the way around that is to engage. So I would challenge you over the next two weeks and just see, see what happens. 
um, over the next two weeks, reply to more people than you post. So keep posting your original content, keep tweeting out whatever your stuff is, but then go to those same hashtags that you're tagging and reply to the other people. And when you start engaging with them, they will start engaging with you. Oh yeah, um, I do. It's, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, but I, I need to do it more. I, I, I will, you know, I'll agree with that. I, I definitely need to do it more, but that's another thing they said, you know, get out there and engage. And I follow several different hashtags and I'll go to the hashtags in the morning and, and make sure that I comment on some of the ones that make sense and that I kind of follow the thread and go back in. And, but it's tiring. It's time consuming. It's I don't so have that kind of time. Tiring. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're, you're putting almost more effort into people you don't know than, you know, the people in your own world because yeah. I have to talk to these people on Twitter and TikTok and Facebook that I don't know. So, you know, family, go do something and entertain yourselves because I'm busy. Yes. It's, it's really, it's hard. It's, it's time consuming, but it, it, it takes that time to build that audience. And um, I can tell you that I haven't been very active on my uh, social media pages in a long time. And um, I, I can see the impact that ignoring it has, has had. And yeah. it's, it's hard to get back because I run so many pages. It's hard to get back there. We're like, okay, I'm, I'm still here. Or I'm back. And everybody, <laughs> you know, I'm glad you're, you still like me, but now you need to engage with me too. And I, I post yeah. things on my, on my page, my Stella Samuel page. And it's, it's like my mom, my mom is always there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Thanks mom. <laughs> like she's, she and, and Charles, who's my partner with this Elizabeth River press release, are, they're like the only ones. So building that, that trust back with your audience is, yeah, it's big. It's, uh, yeah, I, I wish we had the, the budget to, to all have a little social media intern or something, you know, yeah, to just do all awesome. this for us. Yeah. Yeah. Then we could just write. That's right. Wouldn't that be great? That <laughs> yeah. would be amazing. That That's would what be I'd awesome. like to do. Just write. Just write. Yeah. Yeah, but I will tell you that I don't know um, who your publisher is or if you self-publish, but um, I know several authors who are traditionally published and they have to engage with their audience just as much. So for me, that um, there's no benefit to, to seek agents for, for novels and, and go that route because I still see the marketing efforts still need to be there. From, from yourself yeah. so absolutely they do and I'm with a small press flashpoint publishing and I I love them um, it's a small lesbian press and and I do I, I love them dearly they're they're they work hard but like you said you still have to do it you're basically doing it yourself I've actually considered self-publishing and I'm working on my third novel now which is a, a sequel to Sandman. It's the second in what will be three in the series of Sandman. Nice. And I've, I go back and forth because with, when you go through a publisher, you get so very, very, very little of the money in the, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, because Amazon and Bella books and, you know, all the places they get theirs and, and uh, Ingram Sparks gets theirs and your publisher gets theirs. And then yeah. you get this, those few pennies that are left over that are tossed your way. And at least with self-publishing, you you get more of it long term. Yeah, you know you're putting out more in the beginning, but you get more long term. And but I just don't know the work that goes into that is just ridiculous. And I don't know that I have the. I just I know I could do it. I could I can teach myself to do anything if I set my mind to it. But to um, to actually have the stamina, I guess, to do that is. Well, I can tell you that if you're doing your own marketing and you're building your own audience, I have a fantastic formatter who is in Canada and I think he charges like $45 an hour and it takes him, you know, two, maybe three hours to format my books. And then of course I always have edits. So I always wow. have to go back to him, um, but he's reasonable. He's fantastic at what he does. Um, I have a cover designer who's fabulous. And, um, and I have editors that I've worked with in the past. I'm currently looking for a new editor because it's been so long since I've published anything that I, I need to 
to go a different route. But like you said, you, you know, you put that, that effort and that, that time and that money in up front when you self publish, but there are people out there that can do all this for you. I mean, you want to have a hot cover. You want somebody to, you know, look at the book and say, I want to buy that just based on the cover. That's what designers are for. Um, editing, you have to have, even if you're a professional, even if you teach, oh, yeah. I'm a professional editor. I still have to have my stuff edited. Yeah. Um, and, and I edit other books and I coach other writers, but yeah, you have to have it edited. Um, and then formatting, you know, it's pretty easy. We're, Charles and I are both formatting the, the annual. Um, but there are definitely times where I'm like, hey, um, I think I messed this up. So I'm going to send it back to you and you need to fix it because, you know, it'll take me three hours on YouTube to figure out what I did. And you'll probably look at it and be like, oh yeah, she just did this. But I hire formatters. I mean, that's, they're, they're all out there. So you don't really have to do it. You just have to have the budget to, you know, pay for an editor or a designer and, and a formatter if you can't do that. And even Scrivener formats for me um, to a certain extent, but there's there's certain, you know, you want to get trim size and all that stuff. But um, Amazon has all that stuff in templates. So it's it's easy. If, if you don't have the budget there, it's easy to do yourself. It's easy to teach yourself. And I mean, personally, I think it's worth it. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about it for this next one. And um, my publisher will probably listen to this too and, and go, what? <laughs> So you're under contract you can't <laughs> and i am you know i am under contract but um i won't be forever yeah and yeah. Uh, i don't know i just i don't i don't i don't know it just seems to me that with the amount of things that i have to do for myself that it might be worth it to have that front end stuff and at least try it you know i might go back crying please take me back please take me back but I don't know. I think eventually I will probably give it a try, at least for one novel, just to to see if I can do it and what the difference is. I'm a big difference person. Okay, so yeah. I've, I've done this, but what if I do it this way? Then what does that look like? And which of those ways makes the most sense to me? And And I've thought about looking for an agent and sending my work to some people that way. I don't know that anyone would want me, but if they did, I the big advantage to that is that you then have someone who has a broader reach than you have that can reach more people than you could ever possibly reach and can reach them across continents and can reach uh, can reach the people who do movies and can reach yep. so there's there's trade-offs in in all of the different ways to do it i think Absolutely. There is, um, to comment on that, I'm looking up his name. I want to make sure I get it right. Cosby, I was going to say, guys, Cosby or Crosby? Um, Sean Cosby, who lives in Virginia and ironically lives not too far from where I used to live. And we have mutual friends that I went to high school with and I met him in a writing group. So it's just kind of, you know, small world. Um, he wrote a book and published it this year. And I think he has an agent. I, I don't know. So Sean, forgive me if you see this. I don't know what, what route he took, but he's um, agent or publisher, however he's, or PR, however he's doing it. He's been in Publishers Weekly. He has now a UK publisher. He's got that, you know, talking about movie deal. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think this book is six months old. Yeah. Um, so there are definitely some advantages to, to yeah. that. Um, he's got the audience that he's built in under a year that I haven't built in six years, you know, mm -hmm. but, and he's, probably selling more, which means his, his smaller royalty is making more than my larger. <laughs> so that's right. There, yeah. You, you have to, yeah. to weigh the, the pros and cons. Um, I think an, an agent is, is definitely helpful. We'll, we'll look out for you and, you know, um, but it depends on what your goals are and what you want to do. I've thought about mm -hmm. it myself. It's just, uh, I don't think I'm there yet. So yeah. yeah it's One day at a time in this world. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I released my debut in 2015 and was on a roll for a little while and then moved to Phoenix and then um, like, like life just was put on pause for about three years and then I went back to school and um, and then it just sat, you know, it's, it's, it's still out there, <laughs> yeah. but I haven't done anything with it. So it's, it's almost like for me, it's almost like starting over. It's tough. Yeah, yeah, it is. 
Well, but now you're, you're doing there. this anthology, which is exciting. Yeah, well, and it's funny because that started as, I don't, I don't know if you see this with your students, but that this all started a couple of years ago when I was clearly a, an adult. Um, back in college, I studied theater the first time I was in college and decided I wanted to go back and um, get the credentials for, for writing and for editing and for publishing and uh, all the stuff that, that I was sort of doing um, and wanted to to dive into. And then I wanted to get into TV writing and, and screenplays. And um, anyway, I, what I saw from the younger students, you know, mostly out of high school, or, or most of them are, are about 20 or 22, yeah, younger kids uh, or younger adults, was that they were submitting a lot and they didn't know really where to submit and they didn't have the budget for like duotrope and um, and then they were just getting a lot of no's. I mean, we all get no's, but yeah. it, I realized like there's some, there's a market here for somebody who can support, you know, young writers or new writers or up and coming writers or even established writers. We have quite a few established writers who've been around for years and have published a lot, um, but continue to write smaller pieces and they don't know what to do with them, you know? So I wrote a short story and I put a lot of time into it and I don't know, you know, can live on my website, but I don't know what else to do with it. I could share it on Facebook for my family and friends, but I don't know what else to do. So yeah. I thought that I wanted to create a, a space where um, writers could come and, and kind of build a tribe of, of people that they can learn from and, and connect with. And originally it was going to be a magazine. It's, I still may go that route, but we, we had to do something because I had opened up submissions back in August for a December release. <laughs> and um it, this thing is coming out in June so at some point I just had to say like we just, we have so much let's just take the ones that we love and um and, and make it a book but I would love to do a, a um like a quarterly uh magazine and then take the best of the best and turn those into a book but we'll that see. would be awesome yeah, yeah it would be cool it would be cool, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, see how much time I can put into it. Sorry, my dog is barking. Um, see how much time I can put into it and, and how much effort we get. So I don't know what she wants, but she is. She wants something. <laughs> she's barking. Yeah, I don't know. So anyway, I have um, taken up a lot of your time. Sorry, but I, I wanted to yeah. talk about Pride Month and I wanted to tell you about the Hershey bar because I thought that was such a cool connection that you yeah. had written about it and been there and you were as upset as I was that they're gone um so I don't know anyway yeah but it was great talking to you thank you for your time yeah. I am going to pick up book, book of promises and the Sandman I I actually might have um Sandman um on my Kindle I I want to say I do but uh, but I haven't read it I haven't read anything outside of craft books and industry stuff in probably two years. So I, I need to get caught up on reading. Yeah, me too. So much yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Okay. But thank All you right. for letting me talk to you. That was awesome. Yeah, it was good to get to know you. That's really, it's really interesting to, yeah. to connect with somebody on Facebook or add them as a friend because they're a writer and and then you know when you kind of dig in deep when you take the time to dig in deeper and you're like oh that's cool I want to know this person so yeah. thanks for that I appreciate your time yep you too I'll talk to you soon all right take care